Brothers and sisters, good morning. When you look at the world today, there are so many fighting going on. There are many people in the news who are fighting for control, for power, for influence. There are those who are fighting for survival, fighting to make a living. There are also those who are fighting to get uh, their voice heard, to become more popular, to become more famous. And there are those fights uh, sometimes that we don't understand like fighting among the family or even within the church and you wonder whether or not the fight is worth it I asked you this morning what are you fighting for and is it worth it this morning our brother will be our brother Johnny will be talking about the topic of fighting the good fight we let us pray for God's understanding and uh, God's uh, teaching this morning. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you. We thank you for the message today and we pray for uh, that we pray that you speak to each one of us. Help us, Lord, that we would understand and also learn from your word. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Uh, welcome to our Sunday morning message and greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our topic today is fight the good fight of faith. And the reference verse is found in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. 
Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Okay, let's have a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your faithfulness. Indeed, it is by your grace that we can come in your presence today because you are good to us. Lord, we commit your word this day that you would speak to us, you would touch our hearts, mold us and change us, transform us unto your likeness. May your word indeed um, sink deep in our hearts and may it be a reality to each one of us. May you give us the strength indeed to fight the good fight of faith and keep your testimony. We commit our time to you. May you speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, several months ago, we shared about the secret to peace and the safest place. And these topics all point us to where we should focus our hearts in order to have peace and where to find our refuge and our strength. And they all point us to God himself who is the author and finisher of our faith. And this morning, our topic, Fight the Good Fight of Faith, focuses on where do we draw our strength to fight this fight of faith, and how do we win to fight this good fight of faith. There are three questions that we need to consider in this verse, First Timothy Chapter 6, verse 12. Why is our fight a fight of faith? Why did the Apostle Paul call it a good fight? How do we fight to win the good fight of faith? The first question, why is our fight a fight of faith? Our faith is often threatened by doubts and unbelief, and we must fight to maintain our faith. The phrase, fight of faith, would mean the struggle to keep on believing God, the fight to keep on trusting His promises. The enemy always wants to attack our faith. And is there God really? Or do you see God? God, do you hear him? Do you talk to him? The enemy tells us, seeing is believing. But Christian faith is not about seeing and believing. Christian faith goes beyond what our naked eyes can see, you know, what our visible eyes can see. It is like the wind. You cannot see the presence of of the wind unless the wind passes by and the leaves of the trees move. Or when there is a strong wind, when it passes by, you can feel its presence. And Hebrews 11 verse 1 tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The dictionary may not give us or may not be able to give us a a clear definition of faith, but the Bible is very clear in its definition of faith. Faith is not seeing, it's not just seeing. It is experiencing who God is, how faithful God is, and not only in your life, but also in the lives of other believers. And we need to maintain the fight of faith because our faith is with the unseen because our fight is with the unseen forces around us. Ephesians 6 verse 12 tells us that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly, in the heavenly realms. The fight of faith is not just 
when difficult situations arise or when trials and trouble come around us. But it is an everyday fight. We need to fight to keep the testimony of our faith. We cannot just um, shout when we are angry. We need to control our temper. Or when we drive, we need to keep our cool. When another driver cuts our lane, we should not fight back. We need to keep our testimony in our home, our workplace, and in everywhere we are. Fighting the fight of faith is an everyday matter. It's an everyday fight of faith. And we must pursue and maintain the fight we have the faith we have in Christ. And we must not rest content as though the faith we have is all we need. Or as though the faith we have will always remain in our hearts without a fight against the forces of unbelief or forces of the unseen enemy. If you, bega- if you begin to become uh, careless in your Christian life or if you begin to let your guards down, thinking that some past act of faith will save you without any struggle to persevere, you must you might um, sooner or later fall or stumble from your faith. So we need to maintain our faith, keeping this fight of faith. Now, we must not let our guards down when we f- fight this fight of faith, lest we fall. First Timothy 4.7 says, Paul tells us that at the end of his life, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Keeping the good fight, finishing the race, keeping the faith, all mean one thing. Fighting the good fight of faith is the struggle and the battle with God's help to keep our faith. It's a faith that every true Christian should keep in order to take hold of the eternal life that we have in Christ Jesus. Secondly, second question. Why did the Apostle Paul call it a good fight of faith? First, because we are not left on our own strength. No. In Philippians 2, 12 to 13, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill His good purpose. When a believer fights the fight of faith, God is really the one who is behind the struggle, who is giving us the will and the power to to defeat the enemy. And we are not left to ourselves to sustain the faith. God fights for us and in us. Secondly, because it involves humility not exaltation. The fight of faith is good because unlike most fights, it does not involve self-exaltation but humility. Now, m- most fight is not good because it is a proud attempt to prove our own strength at the expense of another. But the fight of faith is the opposite. It's a way of saying that, that we are weak and desperately need the mercy of God. And by nature, we do not want to admit our weaknesses, but God's word tells us in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. The very essence of faith is the admission of our sinful helplessness 
and looking up to God for mercy. No? We really need His mercy and grace no? to daily fight our good fight of faith. No? Just last month, it is by God's grace and mercy that uh, when Joan had her checkup for her kidney, it is indeed His mercy that there were no stones on her kidney after six months from her operation. Now, the stricture on the urinary tract of her left kidney was corrected after the third operation, last April. The opening uh, of her urinary, urinary tract remained normal. That's why there's a free flow of urine from the kidney to the urinary bladder. And it is indeed God's mercy that she is cleared of kidney stones. Now we can say she is stone free. You know? And her next checkup would be one year from now. Thirdly, because by it, God is glorified. You know? When we focus our hope in God and not on ourselves, He is exalted. Trusting in ourselves gets us glory, but trusting in the power of God gives Him glory. In fighting the good fight of faith, we should acknowledge that our strength and power is from God, not from ourselves, that He will receive all the glory and honor. And fourthly, because it has eternal value. The verse says that fight the good fight of faith and take hold of the eternal life that we have in Christ Jesus. And in order to take hold of the eternal life we have in Christ Jesus, we need to fight the good fight of faith. We need to continue to fight the struggles that challenges our faith. Olympic athletes um, they train hard, they compete hard to win the gold medal. They may win the gold, the fame, the glory when that goes with it. But still, it is something temporary. Now, we are not saying not to do your best in your secular work, not to excel. Of course, we need to do our best in our work, but let us not forget to give more emphasis on the things that have eternal value. The third question, how do we fight to win the good fight of faith? Fighting the good fight of faith is remaining true to God and His Word in spite of the difficulties, the opposition, the op op oppression, or adversities. It is having an unswerving allegiance to God despite of the hostilities around us. And to better understand why Apostle Paul wrote this verse, let us look at some of uh, its biblical and historical background. When Paul wrote um, the official of 1 Timothy from a Roman prison, he wrote it to Timothy, who is a young man in charge of the church at Ephesus. And Ephesus was a prosperous Roman city. Its strategic position uh, created a unique environment for trading to thrive. And many of the city's inhabitants were wealthy individuals because of the increased commercial activities in the busy port. Yeah. And a few wealthy individuals from the city um, were converted to Christianity. And among them were some who trusted in their wealth. And Paul instructs young Timothy to warn the new believers against trusting in their riches. So how we do... How do we fight the good fight of faith? 1 Timothy 6.11 11 tells us, 
but you, man of God, free from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Um, the first advice is to flee from sin. You know? Flee from all this refers to flee from sin. In verse 9 and 10, Paul tells Timothy to flee from the love of money, which is a root cause of all evil. The greed for money is a form of evil, and he tells Timothy to flee from this sin. You know? In 1 Corinthians 10.13, you know? No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Yeah. The first thing we find in 1 Timothy 6.11 and 12 is that Timothy was told to flee from sin. Fleeing from sin may look different from one person to another, depending on what struggles and temptation a person may face. For some people, fleeing from sin may look like being honest when lying is easier to do. For others, it may be choosing to be respectful toward others when you want to show your anger. And no matter the sin we face, we can hope to flee from it. And even when we think we have no choice but to make a bad decision or fall into sin, we still have the ability to do what is right. And if we stumble or fall, God will grant the grace to enable us to rise up. Never quit our fight of faith. And secondly, his advice is to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. You know? To pursue righteousness, you know? uh, Matthew 5.16 tells us, In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. No. Um, a desire to do what is right, a desire to be righteous, if it's our heart's desire, the Lord will grant it to us. No. And being right with the Lord, being right with others, doing the right thing, is what God wants us to do. No. He wants us to pursue His righteousness, to do what is right, to glorify Him, to do what is right for Him and for other people. No. And God will grant us the grace to do what is right and pleasing unto Him. And secondly, Pursue godliness. Now, godliness is next list of attributes that Paul gives. In 2 Peter 3.11, Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live, godly, live holy and godly lives. Now, similar to righteousness, it requires us to get to know God and His Word in order for God to lead us in living godly and holy lives. Living a godly life means trying to live and follow His will and framing our actions in the way God wants us to do so. In 2 Peter 3.11, we see a call to holy and godly life. All too often, it can be easy to follow worldly actions instead of living for God. But Paul wrote in Romans 12, 2, you know, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, 
then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Pursuing godliness is like running away from the things in the world that says are not right and pursuing His holiness and godliness. And thirdly, pursue faith. 2 Corinthians 5.7 For we live by faith, not by sight. Faith is another attribute that we can pursue. In Hebrews 11.1 1, Now the conf- faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not see. You know? The verse in 2 Corinthians 5.7 says that we live by faith not by sight. Faith is about having confidence in God's promises and His Word. Faith does not mean that we have to blindly put our trust in anything, but instead, we are able to use wisdom to put our faith in God and His Word. And know that even though something has not yet happened, we still trust. And fifth and fourth, pursue love. First Corinthians thirteen thirteen tells us, and now these three remain: faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. The topic. And uh, theme about love appears many times in the Bible. And in fact, uh, Jesus says that all the commands can be summed up into two commands. And these two commands are both related to love. Matthew 22, 37 to 40. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest Commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Loving God and loving others coincide. If we love God, we should love others. It is not possible to say we love God, whom we do not see, without loving others, whom we whom we get in touch with. In the Bible, love is about attitude and action, not just about feelings. And the Bible tells us to go an extra mile. In Matthew 5, 44, God tells us that we should love our enemies. We should not seek evil against them. And it is unlikely that we could love our enemies, but we could love them only through the power of the Holy Spirit. And fifthly, pursue endurance. Endurance um, is important in the Christian life. As we look at Corinthians 11, chapter 1, verse 11 to 12, no, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of His holy people in the kingdom of light. When life gets difficult, it can be hard to to keep pushing hard. But having strength to continue on and give our best, even when we are struggling, is a trait worth pursuing. This is endurance. We can fight, we can find strength in the fact of the price that is found at the end of the race. And when we find ourselves lacking in endurance, we can pray to God, talk to God, and ask for help, for comfort, and for hope. And the six, pursue gentleness. No. Ephesians 4.2 tells us, 
tells us, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Gentleness is found both in the list of the fruit of the Spirit and also in the, the list of items uh, Paul gave to Timothy. And this trait includes being humble, being kind. You know? This verse groups together humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love. You know? Pursuing gentleness is a choice to resist the temptation. You know? When you are about to show your anger toward others. But instead, treat others with the same respect as you would others want to respect you. And third advice of Paul is to seek godliness with contentment. We will find joy and fulfillment um, in what God has already provided for us. We will draw our satisfaction from living a godly life as opposed to worldly sufficiency. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6, 7 to 8, For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Paul personally had lived this principle in his life. Despite of the hostility and the luck that he experienced, he kept the faith. And he wrote in Philippians 4.12, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry whether living in plenty or in one. Paul tells us that he has learned the secret of being content, both in abundance and in need. He knew firsthand what, what it is to have in abundance and what it is to be in need. That's why he could say with confidence that godliness with contentment is great gain. And like Paul, we can find joy and fulfillment you know, in what God has already provided for us. Selfishness and greed is ingrained in our human nature. Only the power of God can change us. So we, we need to ask God to empty our selfishness and give us contentment. Fourthly, say no to greed for riches. To fight the good fight of faith, we must overcome greed for riches. And as Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 6, 9 to 10, the danger of uh, falling into Love for riches. Those who want to get rich fall into the temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many grips. In these verses, Paul cautions Timothy and the church in Ephesus against greed for money. He calls this greed the love of money or eagerness for money. Now, on the surface, these these verses may give the impression that God is against acquiring wealth by whatever means or even by just means. But when we come closer to uh, examining this verse, you know, God is not against having wealth. And there are two questions that may arise or may emerge from these verses. First is, how is money 
a root of all evil. Secondly, is God against acquiring wealth or riches? No. According to Paul, the love of money is the root is a root of all evil because greed for it tempts and snares many with harmful desires which lead to ruin and destruction. And he further explains that the love of money causes many to wander from the faith and pierce themselves with many pains or many griefs. And note that the Bible does not say money is the root of all evil, but instead it says the love of money is a root of all evil, but not the root of all evil because there are also other roots of evil aside from the love of money. Okay, And the Bible is not against um, having money through just means, but it is against loving money to the extent of sacrificing principle, losing faith, and causing others to suffer to gain it. Is God against acquiring wealth or riches? God is not against hardworking people to earn a decent living through just means. And the fact is that the Bible admonishes us to work hard. In Ecclesiastes 9.10a, whatever you, your hands finds to do, do it with all your might. And also in Deuteronomy 8.18a, But remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth. God is not against personal development. He is against senseless love, desire, greed, eagerness, and pursuit for money to the point of losing or deserting the Christian faith. God is not against wealth, but He is against, against having wealth, but He is against those who acquire wealth through corrupt means. So what do we mean by corrupt means? Now, this includes taking advantage of others, other people's misfortune or oppression or unfair treatment. Though God may give us wealth, Paul tells us not to trust in riches. And Paul tells us to flee from the love of money. You know, the dictionary uh, defines flee is to run away from a place or situation of, of danger. The love of money is a situation of danger. The greed for money is dangerous to your Christian faith. So Paul tells us to seek contentment and not to put our trust in riches, but in God. And in Hebrews 13, 5, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. No. The Christian life is a battle against principalities and um, the powers of darkness. Our faith will be tried and tested. We will face opposition, trials, troubles, temptations, and tribulations. But we need to focus our faith on God and to endure hard times you know, without hesitating, complaining, or quitting. The life of Apostle Paul was a living proof of what it means to fight the good fight of faith. He was stoned at Lystra, but he continued to witness. He was shipwrecked, but he kept on serving God. He was humiliated by weeping five times, but he still kept the faith. Paul's faith was tried and tested many times, but nothing would hold him back. And he testified in Acts 20, 24. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus 
to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Paul considers himself or his life nothing you know, compared to finishing his race and the task of sharing the gospel of grace. For students, fighting the good fight of faith is studying well, getting good grades, attending your classes, even through Zoom with open video, you know, letting the teacher know that you are attentive and participating in class discussion. You know, to young professionals and career people, doing, doing your work well, and striving for excellence in everything you do. To young people and those who are not married yet, fighting the good fight of faith is waiting for God's best, not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Fighting the good fight of faith is finding the right person who has the same Christian faith. To husbands, it is loving your wife as Christ loved the church. And to wives, it is being submissive to your husbands. It is maintaining the order in the family. Now, it is keeping your testimony and being good examples that your children may follow you. And fifthly, the fifth advice is totally depend on God. Zechariah 4.6 tells us, not by, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. To fight the good fight of faith, we must totally depend on God. We cannot rely on our academic background, our spiritual gifts, our past achievements. But we must be watchful in any form of self-dependence or pride. We should not uh, do this by our own strength or wisdom. You know? Paul faithfully fought the good fight of faith and he emerged victoriously. And he finished with power. In, first, in 2 Timothy 4.7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. You know? We too can finish the race. You know? Let us totally depend on God's power, grace, and mercy. As God has been faithful to us in the past, He will continue to be faithful to us to help us fight the good fight of faith until we finish our race. To summarize how to fight the good fight of faith, flee from sin, pursue righteousness, Godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Seek godliness with contentment. Say no to greed for riches and totally depend on God. So let us um, end our message with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you and praise you for reminding us again that we need to fight the good fight of faith, that we cannot do this by our own strength, by our own power, but by your grace, your mercy, and your guidance. Lord, truly, is an everyday fight of faith, and it is all by your mercy that we can do this. As you have proven yourself to be faithful, you continue, you will continue to be faithful to enable us to fight the good fight of faith and keep your testimony until we finish our race. May all glory be yours now and forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Thank you for joining the CGCQC online worship service. Our Friday night Bible study on 1 Timothy will resume next year. For the next two Fridays, please check with your respective care groups for your schedule. Hope has a name. Our God is hope. 
join our last worship service for this year. Don't miss Brother Jackson Chan's message on how to move toward hope. We are closing 2021 with a special year-end conference. CGCQC invites you to welcome 2022 hand-in-hand, heart-to-heart, and shoulder-to-shoulder. Here is the schedule for your reference. Our speaker is Pastor David Goh. We have weekly Bible-based Sunday school classes. Please join us and learn more about God's Word. Here are the class schedules. The Bible teaches us to pray for all people, to make petitions and intercession. Through prayer, let us call to the Lord for our country and our brothers and sisters. Please arrange with your care groups your virtual prayer time weekly. A giving heart is a thankful heart. Give generously and joyfully. You may give your offering online. Here are our bank account details for your reference. Remember to fight the good fight of faith. God bless and keep safe.